Hello, my name is Jim. This is my podcast, The Bloody Vegans. You're very welcome to it. Each week, I'll be travelling ever deeper into the world of veganism, discovering along the way a multitude of viewpoints from the political and ethical to the practical. I'll be doing this through a series of conversations, each aiming to further illuminate my understanding and hopefully yours of all things plant-centric. In this week's episode, I'll be speaking with Alex Lockwood of Lockwood Film. Uh, Alex is a BAFTA-winning director. Uh, He won a BAFTA in 2018 for his incredible film, 73 Cows, um, which charts the story of Jay and Katia Wilde, um, who were beef farmers, um, who inherited a farm through through Jay's family, been in the family for generations, um, and after feeling deeply uncomfortable for a, a good decade... Um, working in the industry, um, he courageously took the decision uh, to to buck the the trends of of generations uh, and switch his farm to uh, a farm that uh, that worked through kind of veganic agriculture um, that essentially grew um, plant based calories, if you like, and he did so with the help of the vegan society, but not without a tremendous amount of personal turmoil. So. Alex and I, uh, we get into that film and, and some of his other incredible works, test subjects, and the forthcoming Monbio, uh, which I personally can't wait for, uh, and is coming out uh, in February of 2020. So without further ado, this is me and Alex Lockwood. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to just get started with a question around like um, your filmmaking, really, and like from a from a filmmaking perspective, kind of who who was your kind of influences? What what kind of things influenced you? Oh, I had um, there's so many that are coming to mind now. But um, to be honest, although his style of documentary making is nothing um, really like mine in terms of the format. Uh, the thing that got me interested in making documentaries was watching all of the Louis Theroux stuff as a teenager because, um, you know, he, he does the whole presenter-driven thing, which I don't do, but what that kind of showed was the interviewing technique that he uses and how he kind of orchestrates his conversations to, um, you know, just get people to relax into talking to him, basically. And uh, I always found that, when I started watching something from Louis Theroux, I would, I would just accidentally, you know, even if you were just watching like in passing, passing the TV or something, you'd find that you'd stood at the door for an hour and you'd watch the whole thing just because it was always something really interesting. So, yeah, definitely uh, I'd say Louis Theroux was the thing that got me really interested in like the documentary form. Yeah, I think yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I probably must be a similar age because I grew up listening, uh, watching uh, Louis Theroux documentaries as well. And there's definitely a, like a disarming kind of style that I found with with uh, with uh, his in- interview technique. That you kind of you might have gone in with an opinion of the of the subject matter, um, but kind of realised the humanity within them, even though you might have disagreed fundamentally with their viewpoint, which I found really really interesting. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, he seemed to approach everything in that sort of looking for the human angle to everything and giving everybody the time of day. Like you say, he interviewed some some people who were doing some really terrible things, but he would talk to them in exactly the same way he'd talk to everybody else in order to try and understand what was kind of driving them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so moving forward, you know, I've, I've, the, the ones I've particularly like of late, I've, I've, I've loved watching a bit of yours, really enjoyed 73 Cows and, and Test Subjects most, most latterly. I'd love to get into those if that's all right. Um, so, so starting with 73 Cows, what, what, what was it that drew you to the story of, of Jay and, and Katya? How, how did you come across them? Um, so I was looking for a documentary subject, um, because at the time I was working in a very sort of corporate job, making corporate films, basically, and it was the same day in, day out, really. And I just wanted to do something in my spare time that would be a bit interesting and that I could call my own and, and you know, something that would kind of marry up to my own ethics as well. 
and um, my wife, Nishat, found this article about Jay, and I just thought it's like such an amazing story because you don't you don't often find people who are are willing to completely question and transform their lives just based purely on their ethics. So I thought he'd make a really interesting case study and I phoned him. I didn't phone him, sorry. I, I dropped them a Facebook message because that was the only, um, it was like the only thing I could find to contact them. I was looking around everywhere and I eventually found Bradley Nook Farm on Facebook. Uh, and it was Catcher that got back to me. And uh, she was just really receptive to the idea and they were like, yeah, come and uh, film whenever you want, film wherever you want on the farm. And it was it was great, really, because particularly coming from like the corporate filmmaking side of things where people are saying, um, you can interview me for 15 minutes um, on a Tuesday, uh, on Tuesday the 13th, and that's that. And if you don't get it done in that time, well, tough luck, you know. And to go from that to them saying, you know, just come and take your time if you if you want, you know, we're, we'll give you our time. I thought that was really, like, nice of them because, you know, they didn't have to help with this. Um, you know, they've got enough on their plates in terms of, like, trying to transition their farm. So I was really grateful for that. And, uh, yeah, I met up with them. I just went without any cameras or anything just to have a chat with them and try and, like, get a feel for what they were what was kind of driving them really. And uh, I spoke for absolutely ages and that's when I realised that there was a lot more to the story than I first thought, you know. I thought that, you know, it's just this nice story about a farmer who decided to do something good, but I hadn't kind of, I'd underestimated the layers to his story and, and, you know, just how much he was being like torn between doing what he thought was the right thing to do and between his family tradition and his community. And, and that's when I started getting, getting like really excited about what the film could be basically. So uh, yeah, it just all went from there really. Yeah, it's a fascinating kind of story and, 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 you know, I'm coming at it from a, you know, it's certainly in the podcast, I'm coming at it from a vegan angle, but the, the, the things that you mentioned there, there's a, there's a really human story amongst it and, uh, that relates to, to, I imagine, many people. The idea of like questioning your your tradition, your heritage, your family values, um, and and I suppose that that is something that probably all vegans have to kind of go through at some point, um, unless they unless they're born into a, a vegan family. Um, was that kind of just a, a bit of a perfect synergy? That did that kind of come out uh, through just through the nature of, of the people that you met, you know, in Katya and Jay. Yeah, I think so. And 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 you you're right. I think a lot of people I know someone in particular actually who's um struggling to become vegan because they know that their family would be so adamantly just perplexed by it and um to then kind of take that up to the scale of completely changing your entire um you know farming existence really. Uh, I just couldn't imagine um what but i think you know just in terms of like becoming vegan in general um i think it is becoming a lot easier and a lot more socially acceptable which is which is great and weird that it ever wasn't socially acceptable <laughs> but um there's all kinds of rhetoric thrown against it and um scare tactics as i'm sure <laughs> sure you know from um within the industry and lots of negative press around it but slowly but surely um people are opening their eyes to it which is which is great and it's becoming more of a normality as the years sort of go on yeah and, and i believe you you went into the film not not being vegan is that right and then and then and then sort of transitioned as a result of it yeah well i was i was vegetarian and um i was sort of I'd say I was kind of going that way anyway, um, but 73 cows probably fast-tracked the whole thing because um, you kind of, if you're making a documentary about something, you want to learn as much as possible about the subject matter, so you watch lots of other documentaries and you try and do as much research as possible and obviously also talking to Jay and Catcher themselves and hearing more about what's involved, particularly within the dairy industry. Um you know, that, that really fast-tracked everything. And uh, so it's been about 
year and a half, I think, I've been vegan and um, just very surprised by how easy it's been and how much better I feel for, for doing it. But um, one, of the, one of the things that really sort of hit home to me um, from Jay, um, and it kind of resonates a little bit more when it's from Jay because it's not something you're hearing sort of in the news. You're hearing it directly from somebody who has been a dairy farmer. Is he said um, something like there's there's more cruelty in a glass of milk than there is in a pound of beef, and he actually stopped dairy farming to become purely um, a meat farmer years and years ago, um, because he found the dairy industry just even though he you know he's a small local farm trying to treat the animals as as well as they could he, even given that he felt that the dairy industry was just too cruel to be a part of and that the meat industry was actually preferable to that and obviously now he's um gone that final step and said actually you know um none of it's justifiable but i i found that very interesting because there's lots of uh misconceptions about the dairy industry and the egg industry um that as long as you're not um directly killing an animal um you know for whatever produce you're getting out of it that it's fine i know even though you end up killing <laughs> the animal for dairy anyway but um you know ultimately but yeah i found that i found that really interesting and that was definitely one of the things i hadn't realized before talking to jay yeah it's, it's definitely one of the things that i think the industry hides incredibly well um through their kind of marketing and so on so hearing it firsthand from a from a from a farmer who's been through it and and, and grown up with it as well, you know, you, uh, out of uh, out of anyone, you'd think he would he would have almost been desensitised to it, but it, it, in fact, it sort of seemed to have had the opposite effect on Jay, um, and he, he lived with it for so long, which was the bit that kind of staggered me with the the film as well that it, that transition process for him, uh, he, he couldn't almost let go of it, and there were so many things that he tried uh, at the point that you first met. Jay and Katya, had they, they had they kind of completed the transition, or were they kind of still uh, in in it to some extent? Yeah, so um, it's it's still an ongoing thing, um, actually, because they're kind of trailblazing. You know, they as far as we know, I think they were the first people to do it in the way that they'd done it in terms of like having. Um, cows and sending them to a sanctuary and now completely transitioning. Um, at least from, from what I understand, they're the first people to have done it. So everything's brand new and there's no set path to follow, which I think they're finding really difficult. Um, and they're still on the way to sort of achieving the ultimate dream because things like planning permission have, have taken so long. I think now they've just got planning permission to set up their polytunnels and um, I think a small wind turbine and things like that. And, and so it's taken, you know, the best part of two years to, to get to a point where they can now kind of really start getting a move on with it. But um, hopefully because of them, it will be easier for the next person who does it and the next person after that, because um, it's almost like you kind of, develop a formula rather than what they're having to do which is just to kind of um guess and also use the support of um uh like the vegan society i know i've been like a huge support to them um and a few other organizations but but yeah generally because they're the first to do it it's just like you know how do we do this sort of thing so yeah hopefully easier in the future <laughs> And I think they're, they're such important trailblazers as well. See, in the in the vegan community, one thing that I've kind of noticed over the last, it's been only two and a half years, but in the in the sort of two and a half to three years that I've been been vegan, I have noticed there's a there's a fair amount of kind of anti agriculture rhetoric, kind of full stop, if you like, that uh, all farmers are kind of lumped in 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 one kind of um, in one kind of uh, like um, lot as as kind of all innately cruel folk uh, and and you definitely get the sense from jay and Katya of their you know their obviously their ethics and their humanity their, their kind of sense of morality and what they're doing 
Was that an important sort of story to tell for you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it came out of, you know, when I said that I had that big long chat with them and we went over loads of stuff and that was another thing that came up that I hadn't expected to kind of consider that actually um, veganism isn't anti-farming. You know, you need you need farmers with any type of food production and there's there's kind of this um portrayal of, of as veganism as being against farmers and so yeah i really wanted to do something that would say actually like no this is an industry which if it takes off in the right way will absolutely need the support of farmers and i think a catcher even says at one point in the film something like uh, farmers just need more support to look at things differently rather than being attacked, which, again, I think is true. I don't think there's, you know, this thing of, oh, if you're a dairy farmer or a, a meat farmer, that you're categorically a bad person. And hopefully that's something that comes across in the film, that just it's just so hard to do something um, against what you've always done and and against what you've always been taught and so it's really really hard for people to to change their perspectives on this and the more you can kind of nurture those people and and support them rather than you know um just alienating them the the better it will be you know um i think that's the way to achieve anything like this it's um not through trying to divide people, but trying to bring everybody together and, and get people on the same page. I, I totally agree. And I think this, as we see sort of veganism rise, it sort of seems to have um, just just coincidentally, you know, it seems to be at a moment in history where kind of divisiveness is is particularly kind of prevalent, you know, whether you see it, whether it be politically in, in social media or, you know, all kinds of things. People are, are very prepared to to set themselves up on these kind of lines of division. So I think, you know, that this, this message is so important, not, and not just for kind of farmers and, and vegans, but um, for, for kind of anyone, really. I think there's a, there's a point about how you get a message across, which you delivered, you know, beautifully through the film. Oh, thanks. I really appreciate that. I think it's, um, yeah, I think it's, if you, if you really push a point at somebody, they can sense it a mile off and they can, you know, people tend to turn their nose up if they think they're being sold to, you know, uh, even if that's just they're being sold a message. Whereas if you try and do something from a more emotional angle, you know, and you do it subtly, I think people are generally more receptive to that. And that's one of the things we tried to do with 73 Cows was not make it this really kind of vegan salesy type thing we wanted it to be more a kind of um almost like a like a kind of story about mental health really which would kind of in tandem make a point about um the meat industry as well so it's kind of like um not a surprise element because i don't think people would be surprised given like the title of the film but you know um just something that wouldn't be in your face and at no point in the film does anybody say like you need to do this or if we don't do that then this will happen but it's all just through the completely personal point of view so that um people don't instantly kind of you know turn their back on it the minute they know what the film's about if you know what i mean absolutely i think you you definitely achieved that you know in spades there's there's that absolutely a, a sense of you know, here is a story of two two people, and 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 you make of it what you will, almost, and and it's it's very difficult to to not extract the 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 humanity, um, the the kind of the care, the passion, the the sort of ethics of of those individuals, uh, and also the the pain, the sort of struggle that they've been through. You, you know, you can you sort of feel all that, and almost with the colour palette of the film, it feels like that. It sort of feels quite grey at the beginning and and it kind of like lifts you throughout. So um, I think it's absolutely achieves that aim that you were trying to get to. It would be, I I guess, quite easy and almost probably quite reductive for for the kind of 
elements of the press um, to to kind of refer to you as a vegan filmmaker. Um, how, how have you found that? Have you, have you found that kind of term being used, and how is it? How, how do you kind of personally feel about it? Yeah, I've definitely found um, that term being used to describe me. And uh, at first, it was kind of a bit um, odd because I'd never considered myself a vegan filmmaker. I'd considered myself a filmmaker who is a vegan. Um, but a vegan filmmaker kind of suggests that you're only ever going to make films that are, are around the issue of veganism. And whilst that is true for now in terms of what I'm currently working on, it's not always going to be the case. I think my films will always be centred around issues of ethics and trying to shed light on things that perhaps, you know, aren't in the public eye enough. Um, and for now, sort of my interest is kind of the films that I'm making all kind of link back to veganism, but there's definitely films that I'm looking at in the future that aren't sort of related at all. Um, but I think, yeah, they'll always have that sort of grounding in ethics. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I suppose that brings me on to sort of test subjects because uh, uh, when when you first came into that kind of subject, you'd heard about um, the kind of, you know, the idea of medical testing and that there was this story to be told. W were you coming at that initially from a kind of a, a vegan angle? Was the was the animal welfare going to be kind of front and centre or did were you kind of led to that through the subject matter and the, the people that you met? Yeah, it was kind of like I knew I wanted to do something that was, again, looking at like the people involved and, and the mental health aspect. Um, like, but I was quite naive, I think, in terms of, my level of understanding of animal testing, like, although I wasn't for it, I did have the questions that I think a lot of people have, which is, you know, if we're not testing on animals, then, you know, how are we going to develop cures for diseases and things? And I think one of the reasons that I really, really wanted to make the film was having done a little bit of research and um, having found out just how useless animal testing is and how ineffective it is with relation to the human body um when you kind of scratch the surface of all the evidence and 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 that way of thinking it becomes really really difficult to justify any animal experimentation whatsoever and at that point i really wanted to make the film because it was kind of i, I didn't feel that this information that comes across in the film is is information that's kind of widely recognized uh, even though it's um, all, you know, scientifically recognised. It's not knowledge that is, you know, commonplace and it's still, you know, animal testing is still going on in all kinds of institutions around the world and this this culture of animal testing that kind of needs to be challenged. And, uh, yeah, so I'd, I'd say that was when I kind of got excited about making the film, when I realised that I could actually, like, make a real point with it and from your your position and kind of proximity to kind of the industry you mentioned there that that, that kind of the industry knows it's not effective what, what sort of justification do they kind of give for continuing it that you could see from the viewpoints of the scientists who are in the film um they all kind of and it, i guess it's similar with 73 cows it's so deeply embedded within the culture and the traditions of how you do these tests that it's really, really hard to challenge, particularly if you're a young scientist who's at the beginning of your career and you're, you know, I think at that age as well, it's just so hard to go against the status quo. Um, and if you're a kind of more senior scientist, I think it's, hard in a different way you know it's it's difficult to say okay everything I've been doing in my career could have been done in a much better way um I didn't need to to do these awful things and also you know it's um going against the grain in terms of your peers and um I guess if you're like a, at a senior level you're making money and to go against you know, this behaviour is to say, 
you know, I'm going to go against the thing that pays the bills. So there's all kinds of reasons why this continues. And what I hope is that the film, you know, it would be it'd be great if young scientists watched the film and felt empowered by it and they, they said to themselves, okay, maybe, you know, I do have the ability to challenge this and I, I don't have to do this in order to get my doctorate and um, they can kind of see from these three examples, these three people within the film, that there is another way to go about it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that would be... That would be a, a, an amazing kind of product of the film, I think, if it, if it did inspire. I really hope it does. I'm sure it, I'm sure it will. The, the stories of, of Francis, Amy and, and Emily, who kind of feature in the film, um, are they, from what you saw in that world, are they kind of uh, typical uh, of younger, younger scientists? Or do you, th- do you feel like they're kind of quite um, forward-thinking, quite pioneering almost in their viewpoint? Yeah, it's it's difficult to know um, for sure, but I, I would think that there are, you know, loads of scientists going through this same thing um, because I don't think you're presented with the options. You know, you're told this is the way we do things. And um, I think it's just that idea of going against the grain um, that makes it so difficult that means that very few people actually do end up going against it so it would be it'd be really difficult to know exactly how many people are kind of troubled by what they're doing that's what i found so intriguing about the three stories is that they were so similar but they're happening in different parts of america and these three people had never met and their stories all exist in isolation and they'd all come to their own conclusions based purely on their own research so um take Frances for example she was doing research on rats um and she found that her tests had absolutely no correlation with um human science and the human body and she 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 felt like really alone in terms of like well who do I go to what do I do now that I know that this is all for nothing and I think that's what makes it kind of traumatic is that these people you know there's not like a you know for them they don't feel like there's this body that they can go to or or you know any kind of because it's so deeply embedded within tradition it kind of feels like you're completely on your own and one of the things that i hope comes across in the film is just what an impact it has not just on the animals which is kind of obvious but also on the people carrying out the experiments um Frances in particular, um, she kind of, she got very emotional when she was talking about what it was like to test on animals. And I said, uh, you know, do you want to stop filming? And she said she thinks it's really important that people see, you know, what it does to the human to test on the animal. So that was that was an angle that I thought was really interesting. Uh, it, it definitely is. And the, and the, the, the line that sort of... Um sort of stuck with me that Francis said was, you know, humans aren't meant to kill. Um, and, and I found that kind of quite, um, it was sort of quite a, a crystallising moment in the film, sort of really, where it all kind of came into sharp relief, if you like, about not only what they were doing, but I, I sort of watched it in context of, you know, 73 cows and then my own personal kind of journey in, into veganism. And then you start to think about the broader subjects of how society kind of justifies the 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 kind of um, enslavement and killing of animals, and you kind of think, well, that that is that's what it boils down to, <laughs> you know, that we're we're ultimately not not meant to do that. Yeah, completely. I mean, it's um, it's kind of obvious when you think about it, but we we do all sorts of things based on what other people are doing and on social conditioning and all of these factors. And um, yeah, I can't imagine what it was like for these scientists to go through this and 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 to feel alone on it and uh i think it's it's really courageous that they've kind of you know they all individually turn their back on their education um even though at the time they felt like they had absolutely no support whatsoever that 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 definitely stuck with me as well that sense that you mentioned there that there's the stakes 
were potentially very high for them. You know, this is this is their entire kind of like um, you know childhood and adolescence, and then into into early adulthood studying. Um, and yeah, the stakes being that high. Did, did you get that that sense from them that they they felt a genuine sense that they may not be able to complete their doctorates? Oh yeah, completely. I mean, um, Amy. Uh, well, Francis uh, said something literally about that precise moment that she was kind of thinking, "Do I carry on with this or do I stop?" And she said that she decided to carry on because she felt that ultimately she would be able to save more animals if she had a degree behind her. But she kind of, to this day, doesn't know whether that was the right decision, the wrong decision, whether she, you know, made that decision because it felt easier at the time. And, um, yeah, I mean, if, if, and then afterwards, um, you know, uh, Amy, she spoke about kind of the feeling of having spent, 10 or whatever years in education and having this degree that she felt she couldn't use because it was specifically, you know, related to a science which uses animals. So it's, it's kind of that um, problem of like, where do we go now? You know, how, how, how do I kind of go on in my life without having wasted a huge portion of it? I think like with this and 73 cows, you, you talk about that kind of sense of, that kind of like the moment of um you know i may not be able to use this degree uh and with with 73 cows is a similar sort of moment where you kind of almost feel like you know how is how are jay and katya gonna gonna move beyond this and then it there's sort of all all, all kind of um there's a there's a positive path that starts to to reveal itself if you like for for the the the, the folks in uh, test subjects um how was it that they kind of went about using that that degree kind of afterwards um, for for the kind of the the good cause that they wanted to fight for? Yeah, so all three of them now um, have gone on to to work to combat animal testing in um, in different ways, but they're all working towards the same aim, really. So um, Francis, for example, she's working with companies and she's kind of showing companies, well, you know. Um, you could do your science like this instead of something that uses animals. And because she's doing it in that sense, she can see specifically what that company was going to do and specifically how many animals that company would have had to use for that test, which means that she has, like, she can literally see how many animals she's saving and she's kept a tally over the years Um and she's now at a position where she's saved more animals than she's killed, which was kind of like a big landmark thing for her. Um, you know, she's she's kind of under no illusions as to thinking, like, that makes up for um, everything, but it at least shows, like, you know, it's, it's all heading in the right direction and that she's used her um, past to do something really really good and so yeah they're all doing things in their own ways that contribute towards combating animal testing which is which is great really yeah that that element that you, you mentioned there that that francis is is quite literally quantifying the the kind of unpicking if you like of the damage just really does speak to the the kind of the almost the ptsd kind of element that she she's kind of experienced that she she really feels the need to make this this men's this kind of like balance the karma, if you like, um, which is quite, like I say, quite remarkable. I'd, I'd love to sort of come on to the the kind of the BAFTA. I know we've talked about 73 cows, but I'd love to know what the, the kind of impact, uh, and a huge congratulations, by the way, and so th- so thoroughly deserved um, for 73 cows. Such a, it's such a remarkable piece of work and so so beautifully shot. Um, and a wonderful piece of storytelling. Um, what what would you say? Kind of the impact of the the BAFTA's been on your your career is, I'd imagine, largely positive. But has there been any kind of sense of pressure on on you to perhaps you know with with potentially more funding, uh, changing the tone or subject matter of the stories you tell, or, or is it is it more the opposite? 
Oh yeah, no, for sure. I mean, um, it's had a, it's had a huge impact. It's literally, I know it sounds incredibly cheesy to say it, but <laughs> it has changed my life really. Um, before I know I mentioned I was making these sort of corporate films where people generally don't put a lot of trust in what you're doing. Whereas now it's, it's really nice that people are willing to put that level of trust in me to tell the story in my own way. And, um, also, let's trust in my um, team as well, who I've got to kind of give a, a, a shout out to as well, because they all, you know, were a, a massive part of um, the film's success and, and getting that BAFTA as well. So, um, but yeah, it's um, in terms of funding, it's um, it's great because it means that I can go on and, and keep making films, at least for now, um, which are in line with my ethics you know rather than having to make films about you know wherever you you can um you can get them really in order to pay the bills but um yeah it's great to be able to to feel like i'm actually contributing towards something good and um yeah at least you know i'm under no illusions um it could all stop any minute and but for now i'm just enjoying um you know how finally being able to make films that i feel like are actually useful, you know. And long may that continue. I think um, uh, we, we absolutely need these kind of positive stories as kind of uh, rays of hope, if you like, and 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 people kind of showing the the path in in these kind of various sectors, uh, whether it be about veganism or even just about you know the trying to be on the right side of history, I suppose. Um, I'd, I'd love to sort of talk about what, what's kind of coming up for you on that front. Um, so, so you're currently filming, I, I, am I right? I think there's an upcoming film um, featuring uh, George Monbiot. Uh, I'd love to hear a bit about how that's going. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, so Monbiot is going to be another short documentary about George Monbiot, who, for those who don't know, he's... Um, a activist and journalist, and he's kind of spent his life um, trying to raise awareness of um, issues of animal ethics, issues of social justice, and issues of, you know, the climate crisis, basically. He was talking about the climate crisis long before it became, you know, it became a mainstream thing to do that. And so this film is just kind of a, a, a character study into his activism and um what's driving him really and um yeah it's going it's going really well i mean uh george is is really good to work with because he's kind of a natural storyteller really you don't when you're interviewing him you don't actually have to do that much in order to kind of like uh extract these kind of gems from him you know he's uh he's very kind of comfortable in, in himself and it, and it comes across. And I think, um, yeah, it's, um, we're still filming. We've got one shoot left and it should be coming out around sort of February or just after. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping that it, it, it sort of really resonates with people. Uh, it, it's, you know, there's a, there's quite a big focus on animal ethics and there's also a big focus on, um, the extinction rebellion protest that happened in London, which were very controversial. So a big part of the film is trying to understand whether that form of activism is useful or not. Um, yeah. So I just hope, uh, hope it resonates with people. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it will. Like, like you say, uh, as a subject, uh, you, you, I imagine there's not too many better than, than, uh, than George Monbiot in terms of um, uh, a, a man with uh, amazing oratory skills. So um, <laughs> uh, uh, on, that, on that note, actually, like, was, is it a challenge to to edit someone like that? Like you say, who's who's got so much, uh, so much gold, if you like, in everything that they say. Oh yeah, I mean the the edit is by far and away the longest part of the the whole production process. Um, so, for example, with 73 Cows, which was 15 minutes, we interviewed Jay alone for a couple of hours, um, Catcher for a couple of hours, and uh, with George, I think we interviewed for about four hours. And so um, 
the first step of the process is to just go through and literally watch everything and make notes as, as I'm watching and try and pick out bits that I think are useful and bits that link up to other bits and to try and weave the story, you know, the, like try and find where the arc of the story is. And that takes a lot of time. It's a, it's a lot of um, picking things and then going back on yourself and then watching it again and thinking, oh, is that right? Does that work with this? And, yeah, it's, um, it's a real headache at times, but it's actually really nice when you've got someone to edit like George where um, he's just got that very kind of wise tone and um, as you're editing, you're thinking, oh, yeah, I could keep – listening to this rather than back in my corporate <laughs> days when I'd be editing and I would just be sick of somebody's voice and just think, oh, my God. but, um, yeah, so it's, um, it's all coming along, but yeah, the edit just, it, it takes a long, long time to, to get right. Basically. I bet it does. <laughs> do, do you kind of purposefully, um, and I love this 15 minute medium. Have you selected that to kind of, uh, almost, crystallize the kind of story if you like is there a is there a specific reason for the 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 super short kind of format yeah there's a few reasons really i mean one of the reasons is that it's a great format to actually reach an audience with so what i mean by that is um people can watch these films in their lunch breaks they send them to their friends and they go oh i'll watch that because it's only 15 minutes you know or 20 minutes um whereas if something's kind of on social media and it's 40 minutes long people aren't as likely to watch it um that's when you start getting into your more sort of um your film needs to have a home like a netflix or amazon or something which kind of brings me on to the other reason um for making short films is just as an independent filmmaker um it's it's kind of where most filmmakers start is in the short form format you know because you you start with the smaller budgets and you kind of work your way up and um the ultimate goal is to make feature films and we've got something i can't really say too much about but exciting in the pipeline um which i'm really looking forward to talking about when i can but um yeah and for now yeah the short form format is just it's just a nice way of actually reaching an audience and knowing you know you could potentially have a lot of people taking in the message from your film. Yeah, and they they definitely they definitely are. I think, and I think that is so conducive. I, I mean, I, I think of many friends I've recommended um, seventy three cows and test subjects to, and um, and the ability to, like you say, just literally share over the link and and um, and almost see them watch it in front of you straight away. It's like, well, let's watch it now. Um, it's it's it definitely is reaching um, a, a, a huge audience through that that format. I'm sure, um, which which leads me on to um, uh, kind of where where would we go about finding uh, finding those films if you, if you wanted to um, if you wanted to explore them and I, and I do thoroughly recommend that everybody does. Um, where would they go about finding them? So um, test subjects is on it's currently on at testsubjectsfilm.com. Um, nice and easy um but that might not be up for too much longer it's it's a kind of limited release and then we're going to take it to festivals and uh we're going to do some screenings around schools and institutions like that um i think it will always come back online at some point but for now it's it's online kind of indefinitely um 73 cows is online and that's staying online and that you can find um at either just lockwoodfilm.com or you can find that with mailchimp um mailchimppresents.com um or i think if you type in 73 cows on google and just hit videos it should it should come up um mombio again that will go um online and probably stay online from either weanimalsmedia.com or, or lockwoodfilm.com or both so nice and easy hopefully yeah, absolutely it would be definitely definitely easy to find um and I'll, I'll stick a link in the in the kind of show notes as well so if you're listening to this then uh, then do follow those links um 
My, my final question for you, for you, Alex, is kind of a, a, a broad one, but how, how kind of confident are you that we'll kind of reach the, our kind of, I suppose, our, our ultimate kind of vision of uh, a world that's, that's vegan? Um, I'm, I'm in two minds about it, really. I mean, if you look at how many people are becoming vegan, it's, it's great. I mean, it's, it's happening very rapidly. And it's becoming very easy, particularly in England, to become vegan and it's accessible and, you know, you, there's almost no excuses for it, really. Um, and in that sense, it's very kind of like everything looks very promising, but also um, I kind of feel like, you know, I know lots of people who I know now know exactly the same facts as I know about the environment, about animal ethics, about human health, and they're fully aware of, you know, that they have access to the same information I have access to and they won't make the change. And I'm, in my mind, I'm always thinking, what would need to happen for those kind of people to make the change? And obviously a massive part of that, similar to what I was talking about with test subjects, is just, it's it's a cultural thing, you know, it's it's really difficult to go against or at least you think it's going to be difficult to go against something you've always known and a lot of people have that kind of reservation of thinking oh it's this really kind of extreme thing when in actual fact it, it's not and so yeah I think it's becoming more commonplace and people are definitely opening their eyes to it in great numbers um but it's just trying to find that thing that that will kind of, you know, really resonate and click with the people who perhaps are a bit kind of closed off to the idea, you know. That's the thing that kind of makes me feel a little bit more pessimistic. But I think generally it's it's going in the right direction. Well, I think the, the more you continue to make such uh, such kind of um, impactful films, I think we'll, we'll no doubt be a on a better path towards uh, towards reaching that goal, I'm sure. So a huge thank you for those. Yeah, no, thanks. And 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 that's uh, that concludes our time. So I'd, I'd just love to, to say a, a big thank you for your time, Alex. Really appreciate it. And all the best with uh, Monbiot. Can't wait to see it in February. Oh, thanks for having me.